Welcome to the 2021 Ependymoma Awareness Day virtual event. Hello, my name is Kim Walgren, and I am the Executive Director of the CERN Foundation, a program of the National Brain Tumor Society. Now in its 10th year, this campaign is an international effort from the CERN Foundation and the National Brain Tumor Society in partnership with medical professionals, patients, care partners, and other advocacy groups from around the world as a part of Brain Tumor Awareness Month. Held every year since 2012 as a global advocacy event, the goal of this day is to increase public recognition of this rare tumor and the urgent need for more clinical studies to improve diagnostic methods, develop better targeted treatments, and improve outcomes for those living with ependymoma. This year, we chose May 10th for Ependymoma Awareness Day to bring attention and represent the 10 different molecular groups of ependymoma. One of the things that makes studying ependymoma so difficult is because there is great diversity within the disease itself. In the scientific world, ependymoma is known as a heterogeneous disease. Think of it as multiple diseases within a disease. We know about these differences because of the extensive work that has been done in molecular classification by an international group of collaborative scientists. Pathology allows us to look down a microscope up close at slides of tumor tissue. Molecular analysis allows us to look inside a cell and identify important DNA or RNA changes and markers. The classification of molecular groups and subtypes for ependymoma is constantly evolving. For the past few years, we have recognized nine different types. Today, 10 different major types of ependymoma are recognized and are distinguished according to location, pathology, and distinct molecular features. Understanding these important molecular differences will help guide future clinical protocols designed to identify targeted therapies. It is important to note that it is common for the basic science to move faster than breakthroughs in the clinic. As you will hear today, it is our expectation and hope that these important molecular distinctions will allow us to further refine clinical trials and eventually identify targeted therapies in the future. The 30-minute program to follow will feature educational and awareness content from CERN advisors and members, key issues from the ependymoma community, and will conclude with a butterfly release. In addition, to celebrate the 10th annual Ependymoma Awareness Day, historical clips from previous butterfly release ceremonies will be weaved throughout the presentation. After the virtual event is over, you will be able to watch the video on the CERN Foundation website and can share it with family, friends, or members of your medical team through email or social media. I want to extend a sincere thank you to CERN advisors, fellows, members, and supporters that helped make this virtual event possible. We could not do this without your dedication and commitment to helping the ependymoma community. I know that this day holds a different meaning for everyone. It could be a day of joy, validation, sadness, a day of importance, pride, grief, empowerment, hope, and maybe even disbelief that you're even here to begin with. In fact, none of us probably experience this day in the same way. I know for me personally, each year, as I have looked back on the 10 awareness days I've been able to participate in, I have been in a different place for each one, and it has meant something different to me each year. I want you to know that's okay. However you come, however you are, and wherever you're at in your journey with this disease, we are so glad you're here. We hope this day resonates with you and is meaningful to you in some way. We encourage you to do something that is unique and special to you. But most importantly, we are thankful you are here. Thank you so kindly for your time and participation in this special day. The sun is shining, we have a beautiful blue sky, and frankly, we could not ask for a better day for our first uh, Ependymoma Awareness Event and Butterfly Release. Truly, this has been the culmination of a year-long collaborative effort. Uh, so many people from around the globe have given of their time and their resources to make this day a success. And we wanted to choose something uh, to represent our efforts. And we thought about a number of different vehicles. And ultimately, we selected the butterfly to symbolize renewal and inspiration and hope. We are here, as you may know, to honor the memory of our middle daughter, Kayla, who recently passed away after battling with an ependymoma at the age of 12. The reason that we are here is to see the butterflies that were sponsored in her name. 
And to give you an idea, um, this stack is of, of certificates that we received uh, from people who sponsored butterflies in, in Kayla's memory. I cannot tell you how many people showed up at her memorial service, not in black, but in pink with butterflies. It is nearly impossible to sum up the essence of Kayla in a few mere words. As Dr. Packer, who was with us through the entire five-year period with Kayla, can testify, Kayla was tough as nails, smart as a whip, clever as a fox, and pretty as a princess. Our lives were turned upside down by her diagnosis more than five years ago. One of the cruel things about this situation is that we never really knew if we had days, weeks, months, or years. And as a result, we tried to walk a fine line between living in the moment and living our lives as normally as we could. Each night, when I tucked Kayla in at bed, I would ask her two questions. Did you have a good day, and do you feel loved? For us, these butterflies are a reflection of all the love that helped to sustain us through the pain of losing Kayla. We were not in time to develop a cure for our beautiful darling Kayla. We are very hopeful, however, that you will save many other children. Please know that we are grateful to be with you here today, representing so many other families who are fighting this disease now, who fought it before, and who may someday be forced to fight this fight. Your work through the CERN Foundation gives us all hope, and we in turn hope that these butterflies inspire you to find the answers that we're all seeking. Hi, my name is Jade. My name is Nikki. Hi, I'm Nikki, and I'm from Toronto. So I'm Vijay Ramaswamy. I'm a pediatric neuro-oncologist at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. I'm also a clinician scientist where I have a basic science lab where we work on new treatments and classification of ependymoma. What is ependymoma? Ependymoma is the third most common brain tumor of childhood, and it's a cancerous tumor that can be very difficult to treat that can occur in both children and in adults. What the where? Ependymoma can occur anywhere in the brain or the spinal cord. In children, it usually occurs in the brain or the cerebellum. And in adults, it can occur everywhere, but it's it's common to see ependymoma in the spinal cord. Who can get ependymoma? Ependymoma is a unique tumor because both children and adults can get ependymoma. We're learning more that children have a different type of ependymoma than adults, and they do share the same name. Why does ependymoma grow and what causes it? We don't know exactly why ependymoma grows, but there's a lot of groups around the world that are working on this exact question. Because if we can understand what makes ependymoma grow, then we can try to find new therapies to try to stop it from growing. What are the treatments for ependymoma? The treatment for ependymoma is surgery. So the first uh, treatment that all children and adults receive is surgical resection. And many children also require radiotherapy and some require chemotherapy as well. Are you working on finding new treatments? Currently, I am working on finding new treatments for childhood ependymoma. It's a real challenge for myself and I, for many groups around the world to find treatments for ependymoma, but we are trying to find treatments that are more specific and less toxic for for this, for this disease that may allow us to avoid radiation and maybe avoid aggressive surgeries in, in some patients. Why did you become a doctor for brain tumors? What really draws me to patients with ependymoma is the incredible resilience that children have when they're diagnosed with ependymoma and they undergo treatment. And I feel it's really important that we find new therapies. We're able to maximize the potential of our patients to have the best possible quality of life and at the same time being able to cure them of this devastating brain tumor. What do you like best about your job? So my, the favorite thing about my job are the patients. So I love working with patients with brain tumors, families of children, children with brain tumors, and it just inspires me every day to see how courageous they are, how brave they are, and how they're able to, to make the best of, of their lives in spite of the challenges that are posed by their underlying brain tumor diagnosis. What challenges do you see with ependymoma research? The biggest challenge with ependymoma research is that even though ependymoma is a common brain tumor type for me, overall ependymoma is quite rare. And so we really need to bring together patients and physicians and families from all over the world to work together to bring new therapies to the clinic 
and try to evaluate the best possible therapy for children. Does Toronto have good coffee? <laughs> Toronto has coffee, but I wouldn't really call it good coffee. So there are places you can find a good cup of coffee, but I must say the best cup of coffee that I could have is the one that I make myself at home. What is your favorite kind of ice cream? My favorite ice cream is pistachio. Have you ever played paintball? So I, I have played pa played paintball quite a bit and I've been bruised up and I've been had welts from playing, but but I, I love to go outside and and play all types of sports, including paintball. What's your favorite sports team? So my favorite sports team is the Edmonton Oilers. So I grew up in Northern Alberta and my favorite hockey player growing up was Wayne Gretzky and my favorite hockey player right now is Connor McDavid. What's your favorite sports team? The Toronto Maple Leafs and the Toronto Raptors. And my favorite player is Pastel Siakam. What's your favorite movie or show and why? My favorite show is The Rookie because I want to be a police officer. My favorite movie is Coraline because I like the stop motion animation and the unique style. What's it like to have a brain tumor? Having a brain tumor is not fun because it's a little scary. It's bad and it affects everything in my life. What is something that helps you get through treatments? My animals, my family, and Camp Hooch counselors. One thing that helps me during treatment is watching videos on my iPad that helps me relax. My love of art and drawing. Drawing helps me relax. What should people know about being an ependymoma survivor? You have good days and bad days, but I always stay strong and never lose hope. We're all strong fighters. I don't remember much of what happened in those next few moments. I just remember five words, and they were brain, tumor, hospital, surgery, and now. And I know each of you cancer parents know exactly every single detail of when you first got that phone call or when you first found out the news. And Dr. Gajar, the head of the brain tumor program here at St. Jude, he came over to the hospital, introduced himself to us, and said that he was going to work hard and St. Jude was going to do everything they could to help Ingram beat this. Hearing him say that they were going to help us, that gave us so much hope. And then he tells us the name of Ingram's tumor. He said his tumor is called anaplastic ependymoma and it's a hard one. Many of you will know that ependymoma is a devastating disease. It's a brain tumor that's the third commonest brain tumor in kids and it's the commonest spinal tumor in adults. And because of that unique aspect of affecting children and adults, we've been able to bring together through the CERN Foundation, doctors and researchers working on this disease, both in the adult and pediatric communities, and have really made remarkable strides in that disease over the last few years, identifying some of the first uh, genetic alterations that drive the disease, identifying new treatments that have already gone through clinical trial, and then most excitingly, perhaps finding some brand new compounds that we think can be made into drugs to treat this devastating disease. My name is Dr. Claire King. I'm a scientist in the laboratory of Professor Richard Gilberson, located in the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute. Today, I'm going to show you two areas of our lab and methods that are critical to our research. In the Gilberson lab, we research three types of children's brain tumor, medulloblastoma, choroplexus carcinoma, and ependymoma. 
the aim of our research is to find new, more effective treatments that will improve the outcomes and post-treatment quality of life for children diagnosed with these tumours. To achieve this, we need to understand the biology of the disease, develop accurate ways of modelling the tumour development, and use these models to try on new treatments. Brain tumour research has revealed that each brain tumour type is a distinct disease with different origins, prognoses and challenges. It's also becoming clear that they would also require very different methods of treatment. My research within the lab is focused on a particular subtype of phenopendomoma, known as the Relay fusion positive subtype. These tumours are caused by a very unique genetic mutation, where part of chromosome 11 shatters and rearranges itself, resulting in the fusion of two genes that are normally separated by 73 others. It's not yet clear why this happens or how this leads to the formation of a tumour, but part of our work in the lab aims to understand this. One of the methods that we can use in our research is to grow cells that carry this same genetic fusion. This work takes place in our specialised cell culture suite. We work inside sterile flow hoods to handle and feed our cells. The cells we use either come directly from biopsy samples from consenting patients, or we can artificially introduce the gene mutation by adding a virus that will insert it into the cell genome. Once we've added the virus to the cells, they are kept warm and happy inside incubators to let them grow. After a few days, we can see that the virus has worked using a microscope to detect a green fluorescent tag added to the fusion. These cells can then be used in other experiments, including the testing of new drugs. Currently, one of the challenges with treating a pendomoma is accurately diagnosing which of the subgroups the patient has. For relay fusion positive ependomoma, this can only be done using expensive and lengthy laboratory-based techniques, such as break-apart fish or genome sequencing. Part of our work in the Gilbertson lab has been to develop an antibody that can detect the specific gene fusion in a small section of the tumour using a method called in-situ hybridisation. This method can be carried out in as little as one day and costs only a fraction of the price of current methods. It doesn't require large equipment and can be carried out in a hospital pathology lab. Staining of the tissue demonstrates the location of the tumour. Normal tissue often appears pink, whereas the tumour is a darker purple colour. The in-situ hybridisation method uses a series of antibodies to stain the tissue section and accurately detect the relayed fusion gene in the tumour. Wherever you see the brown staining on the section is where the antibody has stuck to a fusion-positive ependymoma cell. Using both of these slides, we can confirm that the antibody is only detecting the fusion protein in the cells within the region of the tumour. We aim for this to become a method used in clinics to diagnose children with tumours and guide the medical team in the best treatment method. This has been a very short glimpse into the laboratories involved in brain tumour research and I hope you've enjoyed it. We in the Gilbertson Lab would particularly like to extend our gratitude to the CERN and Robert Connor Dawes Foundations for funding part of our work. And thank you for watching. Hello, my name is Christian Piper. I'm a pediatric oncologist and researcher with a focus on ependymoma at the Hopp Children's Cancer Center in Heidelberg in Germany. And today I would like to raise awareness for this disease, for ependymoma, and to shortly talk about the molecular classification scheme of these tumors and its recent developments. Both diagnostics and treatment of ependymoma are associated with various challenges. While ependymoma research has more and more increased over the years, treatment options are still limited with surgery and radiotherapy being three pretty mainstays. Until recently, these tumors were classified and graded solely by morphological patterns. However, we and others found that grading does not accurately predict the clinical behavior. A radiotherapist who treated these tumors back in the 60s of the last century stated that treatment and outcome problems are most probably closely related to inconsistent tumor classification, already demonstrating the very long history of these challenges. Thus, there was an urgent need for a powerful clinical classification and stratification system. We aim to address these challenges by developing an unbiased, robust and uniform molecular classification of abdominal tumors that adequately reflects the full biological and clinical heterogeneity across all age groups and ependymoma histologies. By analyzing certain epigenetic profiles of tumor cells that are relatively stable throughout the course of disease and therefore particularly suitable for tumor classification purposes, we identified nine major molecular groups three in every anatomic compartment. 
the spine, the posterior fossa, and the suprotentorial region. Every group has certain demographic characteristics, that is, age groups or sex tumors are associated with, and specific genetic aberrations. Most importantly, we found that this classification outperforms the previous histology-based WHO classification system with regard to outcome prediction. Application of the classification in a clinical setting is expected to enable assessment of treatment efficacies in the context of specific molecular groups, thereby refining current treatment approaches or allowing for implementation of novel targeted therapies in the future. However, in 2016, only one molecular group named suprotentorial ependymoma rela fusion positive according to the underlying driving fusion gene made it into the WHO classification. The result of extensive joint efforts during the recent years is this new classification scheme that in contrast to the previous version will be fully integrated into the upcoming WHO classification 2021. Further research has led to identification of an additional, unfortunately very aggressive spinal pneumoma group that now represents the 10th group. In addition, the biggest group of suprotentorial pneumoma has been renamed into suprotentorial pneumoma that FDA fusion positive as we better molecularly characterized the actual driving gene of these tumors. In summary, the molecular pneumoma classification will be an integral part of the new WHO classification and therefore of the routine diagnostic process, which is a huge achievement within the care of ependymoma patients. It is expected to shape clinical trials and treatment options and may support clinical decision-making. It will definitely be further refined in the future with new research and additional molecular workup. And it may also help to identify more subtile molecular alterations. I would like to take the opportunity of this important day to raise the awareness for a pandemoma, but to also thank the CERN Foundation, our patients and their families, our funders and supporters, our teams and collaboration partners. Only collaborative efforts led to this revolutionized classification and substantially boosted our understanding of a pandemoma. So it's really fantastic to see how patients, families, care partners, and medical professions from all around the world dedicate May 10th in relation to the 10 molecular pandemoma groups as a pandemoma awareness day. And I'm really highly convinced that this will further increase public recognition and further support us in our joint quest against this disease. So with this, I would like to thank you for your support and thank you for joining today. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. Uh, my name is Steve Cox. Uh, I'm an ependymoma survivor. And my story is a little bit different because uh, I was also a caregiver. Uh, my wife had a brain tumor as well. What are the odds that both a husband and a wife would have brain tumors? None of us can do this alone. We all need to band together as one community. And I think it's a really important message that the National Brain Tumor Society has reached out to an uncommon cancer and has really welcomed us. National Brain Tumor Society, we care about people with all brain tumor types, anyone who's been diagnosed today and anyone who may be diagnosed tomorrow. And this is just an expression of our belief that we should be reaching out and collaborating wherever possible with all kinds of different organizations representing different brain tumor communities. Hello, my name is Tomiko Toland and I'm from Ithaca, New York. My connection to ependymoma is my son Colin, who was diagnosed at the age of two and passed away when he was 10. I want to share an ependymoma key issue with you on behalf of the Facebook support group for parents, appendy families or appendy parents. Education and awareness. Since there's no established standard of care for ependymoma, we call for local emergency providers and community neurosurgeons to have greater awareness of the unique medical needs of the ependymoma community, access to expert physician-to-physician -physician consultation, and more educational opportunities for community providers on the latest ependymoma research and clinical practices. 
In addition, families should have a clear understanding of the capabilities and services offered at the facility that relate to the care they require. This issue is important to me because we dealt with this a lot uh, while Colin was alive, and I continue to support families that are dealing with these issues today. Hello, my name is Andrew Fitzpatrick. And I'm Christine Fitzpatrick, and we're from New Jersey. We lost our six-year-old son, Tommy, to a pneumonia in 2019. Shortly after that, we started the Tommy Strong Foundation in his memory. We'd like to share an ependymoma key issue with you on behalf of the Tommy Strong Foundation. Transparency. The ependymoma community has an enhanced need for evaluation or consultation by an expert neuro-oncology team at diagnosis and before any non-immediate treatment is done. This can be done in coordination with local providers or outside of that relationship. The family should receive transparent and timely communication throughout the diagnostic process and support when seeking second opinions. This issue is important to us because every family gets blindsided by this diagnosis. And no matter where they live, they deserve to have access to the most informed medical professionals so they can make the best decisions for their child or family member. Hello, my name is Alan Campbell and I'm joining from the Bay Area in California. I joined the ependymoma brain cancer community 10 years ago when my then six-year-old son was diagnosed with an anaplastic ependymoma grade three brain tumor. I want to share an ependymoma key issue on behalf of Pinoc Foundation. One of the things that we came across in our journey was a full neurocognitive psychological evaluation taken during treatment. This was offered as a baseline assessment the tests were really lengthy, and at the time, we didn't appreciate how helpful they would be. I'm blessed to say that my son is now 16, almost 17, and a junior in high school. Over the years, these tests have been ongoing, and the summaries have been an incredible tool, really helpful in setting expectations and goals with teachers, coaches, and tutors. The price of survivorship is something you pay for all of your life. Understanding the possible outcomes and knowing how to access appropriate support is priceless. I'm grateful to CERN and NBTS for this opportunity to help raise awareness for pediatric ependymoma brain tumors. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bruce Blount. I live in New Egypt, New Jersey. Over 26 years ago, I was operated on and received radiation treatment for a fourth ventricle ependymoma. Since that time, I have become facilitator for two different support groups. And I wanna share a key issue on behalf of the adult ependymoma online support group with you. Care for patients with ependymoma requires significant coordination and collaboration. Ependymoma patients require access to multidisciplinary care throughout the trajectory of illness and survivorship. Providers should work with the family to identify who is the involved in the patient's medical team, establish a point of contact for each provider, and identify who is the coordinator. The nature and the rarity of this disease requires collaboration between all members of the patient's medical team on an ongoing basis with the goal of prioritizing the patient's outcome and quality of life. Thank you. Hi, my name is Olivia Phelan and I'm from Melbourne, Australia. I was diagnosed with ependymoma when I was 16 years old in 2017 and I'd like to share with you an ependymoma key issue summary statement on behalf of the Robert Connor Dawes Foundation. People with ependymoma have urgent need for increased funding for rare disease research that provides better targeted treatments for the different ependymoma subtypes, increases access to these treatments and evaluates their impact on the quality of life. The ependymoma key issues establish a framework upon which to build greater awareness and understanding of the critical issues facing patients and their healthcare providers. This issue is important to me because I'm a direct and thankful beneficiary of the research being done into the ependymoma subtypes and their treatment options available. 
I was fortunate enough to be treated under a clinical trial funded by the Robert Connor Dawes Foundation, which is the reason my treatment was much less aggressive than it may have needed to be previously, due to the understanding of the specifics of my tumour developed from this research work. This is why research is so important to better understand and improve the quality of life for those with an ependymoma. I warmly welcome all of you to Ependymoma Awareness Day. I am Dr. Mark Gilbert, Chief of the Neuro-Oncology Branch at the National Cancer Institute. I am also an advisor for the CERN Foundation and co-leader of the NCI Connect program with Dr. Terry Armstrong. The NCI Connect program, our comprehensive oncology network evaluating rare CNS tumors, is a cancer moonshot funded program at the NCI. This is focused on uh, rare adult brain and spine tumors, including ependymoma. The program brings patients, advocates, and providers together to improve approaches to care and treatment through education and awareness. The CERN Foundation is one of our founding advocacy partners. In two, 2020, with the support of the CERN Foundation, I'm excited to uh, report that we published the results of a phase two study called CERN 0802. This study investigated the utility of two drugs, temozolomide and lapatinib, in patients who had regrowing ependymoma. The results were quite positive, with many people not only getting disease control and some actually having shrinkage of their tumor, but many of the people who are on the treatment also experienced improvement in their symptoms. This treatment is now approved by the NCCN guidelines, meaning it will be more widely available to people with ependymoma which is quite remarkable. The NCI Connect has another study for people with ependymoma called the Outcome Study that will help us better understand what it is like for people to live with rare brain and spine cancers. This study is web-based, so people can participate remotely. They will answer questions about how they feel and function through the entire trajectory of their illness. From this, we can learn how treatments and the tumor itself impacts their lives and from this, we can also develop educational resources and new research studies to help. Additionally, the WHO or the World Health Organization guidelines for CNS tumors are now being revised, including ependymoma. I was part of a small group called C Impact Now that is changing the diagnostic criteria for some ependymomas. We now know that there are 10 subtypes of ependymoma. So it's really important to understand the differences between these subtypes because it not only advances our knowledge and understanding of the cancer biology, but it will enable us to find specific and better treatments. So I have to say I'm very excited about all of these discoveries and the advances for ependymoma and the international collaborations that have evolved from these very important studies. Over the next several years, I look forward to developing new treatments for these specific ependymoma subtypes, as well as for other rare brain and spine cancers that we are studying as part of the NCI Connect program. Thank you all so much for participating in Ependymoma Awareness Day, and next year I hope to see everyone in person. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brittany Cordero, the Program Manager for NCI Connect. It is an honor to participate in a Pendomoma Awareness Day hosted by the CERN Foundation, who is an NCI Connect advocacy partner. NCI Connect partners with nonprofit organizations who are essential to help us better understand the issues patients experience so we can conduct research and develop new approaches to care and treatment. Our partners also help us reach and engage more patients and caregivers, so together with the CERN Foundation, we can better serve the Ependymoma community. Hello, and thanks for joining the 10th Annual Ependymoma Awareness Day. I'm Kristen Odom, the Communications Editor for NCI, and I'm also a CERN Advisor. Through NCI Connect, we have developed numerous educational and support resources available to you. This includes the NCI Connect website that has coping and diagnosis information, and this year we have expanded this content to include symptom management and self-care strategies that you can find on our website. We've also created a new symptom management app called My Story, where you can track and manage your symptoms. 
The My Story app will be available in the Apple Store in June. And lastly, if you're looking to connect and share with others in a private group, you can join our Facebook group called NCI Connect Community. There, we share educational resources like positive coping strategies and watch parties where we discuss scientific advancements. Thank you to the CERN Foundation for inviting us to share our latest projects, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Alone, I think we can go fast, but together we can go far. And thank you to David Ahrens for what he's put together here because the collaboration with the NCI and MBTS and CERN has been amazing and I think will make a difference. Thank you. That CT scan changed my life. It came back with a massive brain tumor. I somehow knew that my time wasn't over, but I knew I was forever going to be changed. I then asked my mom who raised me and she said, this is the sign. You'll now understand the patient's perspective. Go for it. I didn't know that when I woke up from surgery, I would be a future neuro-oncologist. I'm a son, I'm a brother. I'm a dreamer, I'm a fighter. I'm a Spartan, and I'm an e-pendemoma survivor. But most of all, I am Ian. I didn't choose cancer, but it chose me. I didn't choose to lose 17 months of my childhood to hang out at hospitals with IV drips, harmful drugs, horrible infections, and a feeding tube. My doctors say things like, we had a home run with this one, and he was a medical wonder. I think I'm just me, Ian the kid with nice hair. This is my awesome life beyond cancer. <laughs> The way it should be. I have the best job, the best friend, and the best family. I didn't choose cancer, but I chose to beat it. In closing, I just want to give others hope that there are good days to come. Fight for them. Go green. <laughs>